Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Last time I talked about my entire story as an attractions cast member in Tomorrowland as well as what it is like working crowd control for fireworks and such. If you're interested, go ahead and check out that card that probably just popped up to see the playlist of the other videos. Anyway, this video will be covering the guest interactions I had while working at Disneyland Star Tours. If you're unaware, I learned Star Tours after returning from the shutdown from the pandemic, and I worked this attraction off and on from July of 2021 to December of 2023. While I did hire in the company in May of 2019, Star Tours was the third and final attraction I learned while working at the resort. Now, I would do these in chronological order, but just keep in mind, I was also at my other two attractions on other days as well. It's not like this was the only attraction that I knew. I'll try my best to section things off into chapters for this video, so timestamps will be available on the video as well, as, you know, in the description for those looking to hear about that one specific thing or returning from something they were doing earlier or whatever, I don't know. As stated before, this video has no exact timeline, but I will try to mention the time frame when certain interactions happen, but most really aren't necessary. The only thing that is still worth noting is that there were still mask mandates, and that obviously will be close towards the start of my time at Star Tours. I would also highly recommend having a basic knowledge of the surface level operations of the attraction, and I do have a mini series that does cover my attractions, if you want to check it out. Now, without further ado, I present to you my guest interaction stories from Star Tours. Greeter and Lightning Lane I figure I start off with the front of the attraction. Being at the greater position, as well as the lightning lane side, has its own stories to tell. Now most of these are pretty much what you expect from being at these positions, but I figure, you know, I tell my stories too since, you know, you're watching the video. Starting off, when I learned this attraction, we did not use our lightning lane side until it was, you know, introduced very conveniently for the holiday season of 2021. I will cover all of that in just a moment though. From July 2021 to roughly April of 2022, masks were required at all indoor locations, regardless of vaccination status. Well, being at the greeter positions, you would have to give all the dummies a mask who are unaware of this rule. Now, if it were earlier in the day, I would get it 100%, but I usually worked in the afternoon evening side, as I'm not a fan of working mornings. So, um, can you tell me why I have to fight with 20 dummies every 5 minutes at 7 o'clock at night? We have signs plastered everywhere, and by this time of the day, you should have known it's a rule. We had to hand out masks like candy, which would distract us from other important things at that position. Now, just to go on a quick side tangent about masks, I understand it's not fun to wear and it goes against your rights, but you gotta understand that I don't care. I'm just told that you can't enter the building unless you got an approved piece of cloth on your face. Most idiots would wear it wrong, and it's just like, how brain dead can you guys be? I truly understand why people hated customer service jobs during the pandemic because the amount of mental retardation these people have when it comes to following basic rules is astounding. I'm surprised they even made it to the park with how dumb they are at following rules and directions. Getting back on topic away from the mass thing is that guests don't know what they're going into, let alone where they're going. The most common question I would get at tours is if it's like a museum or a walkthrough attraction. You'd have to explain that it's a motion simulator and it's got 3D glasses and such. Then they would either walk in or ask a question about something completely unrelated. Now, I understand these types of questions and yeah, you get these questions like a lot. It wasn't really a big deal, but you know, I will talk more about this too in my Autopia and Monorail guest stories videos as well, because trust me, they get pretty fun at those attractions as well. If you watched my surface level operations video on Star Tours, <coughs> you would know all the boarding requirements for coming onto this ride. I mean, some are pretty much common sense, but others require a bit more questions to be asked. For example, wheelchairs can go onto the flight deck, but have to be taken into the VIP hallway to get there. Electric scooters cannot though, and this is for fire safety reasons, a smaller elevator, and just the lack of room up on the flight deck. I would get so much pushback at Greeter with people in their scooters. They would always say, well, Florida lets us, or you just don't understand us handicapped folk. And then I would have to explain it to them and I would get more pushback. 
I even had one old guy call me a nerd straight to my face. Then he proceeded to do a 180, crash into the wall, and fall out of his scooter as he called me some more, um, friendly words. Listen, I don't like being the bad guy at this position, but it's best I tell them now before they get all the way up to the flight deck. What am I talking about? Well, the dreaded height requirements for this attraction. How dare I ruin your family's vacation because baby Jimmy isn't 40 inches, let alone strong enough to stand up on his own. You don't know how many times myself and other cast members have been cussed out over height requirements. It used to be not as bad, but after the pandemic, I would normally get one to three an hour. I'm just going to say this for every cast member across all parks and even for theme parks that aren't Disney. Your kid must meet the height requirement to go on the ride. How hard is it, man? Truly. It's not a hard concept to grasp. Star Tours has a ton of shaking and is very motion based. I don't know about you, but shaken baby syndrome is a real thing, and going on a shaky ride is a quick way to get your baby all sorts of messed up. Speaking of babies, I have another story at the greeter position regarding babies. Before you ask, no, they didn't go on the ride, but it's what me and my other coworkers saw when we were standing at the greeter spot. So, set the story for you. The park just opened like 20 minutes ago, and we have a small trickle of people coming in. This one family comes up, and the dad takes the kid who is tall enough inside the building, while the mom stays outside with the small infant. Well, we saw the mom take out a bottle, and we were like, oh yeah, probably getting some formula for that baby. <laughs> nope. This mom cracked open a can of Coke and poured it into the baby's bottle. They then proceeded to hand it to the infant child, and of course, the baby was drinking it up. My coworker and I were in disbelief. Now, I'm not going to say what's wrong with it, as I'm assuming most of you are smarter viewers, and you can understand the basics of why you don't give an infant child soda. <sighs> now, of course, I do have more stories to tell, but they're pretty much all the same thing. So let's go ahead and flip over to the Lightning Lane side. I'm sure most of you are aware of the Lightning Lane horror stories from other cast members, but god damn I hate Genie Plus and its Lightning Lane features. What also makes it another level of fun is working Star Tours and people assuming that we're Rise of the Resistance or Smuggler's Run and they have to use their lightning lane here. We then have to explain where it's at and then they get mad at us for not paying attention to the map. Yeah, for those of you unaware, those are in Galaxy's Edge on the opposite side of the park. Don't ask me why they did that, I just worked there. Basically, pay attention to what you book because this is a very common thing. And I do understand the confusion, but still though, come on. Another bucket of fun is, you know, the people that didn't have Lightning Lane, or did have it, but just didn't book anything. The most common thing guests would come up to the Lightning Lane side and just say the famous phrase, I have the genie. Like, okay, go ahead and scan your ticket. And then they stare blankly at you and say, I have the genie. Yeah, I understand you have the genie, but you have to scan your ticket. And then they would look at you again and say, I have the genie. Yeah, you get where this is going. You'd have to explain that they have to book a reservation as they scream they had the genie 40 more times. To be honest with you, as I got closer to the end of my time with the company, I just stopped fighting these clowns and said, sure, go on in. Then they would, of course, go inside and tell all my other coworkers they had the genie when they got to the split where the both lines merge. The other thing is guests didn't know they had to pay to go on the lightning lane side, and to be honest, this also was an issue when it was free or the fast pass system. The biggest complainers were always when the line was too long and they didn't want to wait so they begged us if we can let them skip the line. Sometimes, you know, I was nice and I let some people in until they decided to pull the, oh yeah, we have 29 more people with us card. Don't take advantage of a cast member's niceness and do crap like this. Now that brings me on to the next topic, which I will cover in the next chapter of this terrible video. Being the bad guy. You heard that right. There were so many times where I, and a few other of my coworkers, had to be the bad guy. I can promise you that we don't get a kick out of ruining your vacations, and overall ruining your day. Unfortunately, sometimes things are out of our hands, like your kid not being tall enough, or the ride system breaking down. Now you're probably wondering why I would make a chapter about being the bad guy and why it's sort of important to this attraction. Well, it all comes down to the nature of this attraction and the size of the seats, as well as some other things that I'll get into. 
Now, this next part might offend some of those who are a bit on the heavier side, if you um, catch my drift. The seats at Tours aren't exactly designed for those of a bigger posture. If you cannot sit in the seat and buckle up properly, you most likely aren't going to ride this ride, or at least ride comfortably. This next story is sort of related to this. Well, to paint the picture for you, a man was on the very heavy side and came to the attraction and was already frustrated that he could not bring his scooter into the building with him. He then made his way up to the flight deck and ended up making his way to one of the cabins where he waited to board. He made his way into the cabin and found out real quick that, you know, he wouldn't fit. And I was just bumping into the turnstile position when this guest boarded. And I was called over by one of my coworkers about a situation. Well, I walked over and my coworker was unable to get the handicap seat closed because of the guy's um, fatness. Wouldn't allow the swivel arm to lock back into place on the seat. I then had to be the bad guy and state to him that due to the nature of our ride and our safety policies, that he could not ride with the swivel arm open on the handicapped chair. He then cussed me out, obviously, and wanted to speak to our supervisor, which luckily the lead of the attraction was nearby to talk to him. Basically, the moral of the situation is that this could have been avoided if my coworkers at the greeter position told them that he wouldn't be able to fit. This guest was very upset and pretty much demanded all of us be fired on the spot. I got most of the blunt for being the bad guy, but my lead said it, I did the right thing even if it was a hard situation. Unfortunately, there are situations like this where we do have to be the bad guy and say things that are uncomfortable even if the guests don't want to hear it. I did feel bad at the time, but you know, I would assume if you were that size, you would understand what your limitations are at a theme park. Now, let's move on to another fun situation, but I didn't feel bad about giving the bad news. Believe it or not, some guests don't like to follow safety rules and regulations at the parks. You can see that firsthand with all the signs at the Guardians of the Galaxy attraction, with the dummies loosening their seatbelts and doing idiotic things for TikTok clout. It was starting to get to the point where some guests would sit on their seatbelts, loosen their seatbelts, or just not wear one at all, but think we wouldn't see it. Just to give you a spoiler, yes, we check every goddamn seatbelt and make sure you give it a tug. I don't think people understand that while some may think it's unnecessary, it's for your safety and so the company doesn't get sued for these guests being a big dumb stupid idiot. Well, this part of the chapter is where I was the bad guy, but I didn't feel bad about being one. There was, and probably still is, a small problem where some guests would bring in a fake buckle with a yellow tab on it. Yeah, this is a good way to trick the computer to say that you're buckled up, and you might get past the lazier and or newer cast member, but I caught it at least 5 or 6 times while I was there. The funniest one that I had was this guy who had the fake buckle, but didn't want to tug on his seatbelt when I was checking. Like, he brought attention to himself by not following simple directions, I ended up seeing the fake buckle, and I ended up confiscating it. I told him that he could still ride, but he had to buckle up, and he chose to, you know, actually buckle up this time. He then swooped around and asked for it back after the ride was over, and I told him that he could talk to security if he really wanted it back. Now, some of you are going to probably say, Wow, you stole that guy's buckle? Isn't that his property? You know, technically, yes, but I don't feel bad. My leads or managers would have done the same exact thing, but instead not let him ride and probably kick him out of the park. Another fake buckle incident where this happened is one of the best times to be an idiot. When I was being audited by my manager and my lead, this dude was all confident because I sort of ignored it because I knew what I was going to do. I unlocked the seats after I was done checking everybody and called both the, my manager and my lead over to this guy. They both saw this cocky bro sitting like a dingus and asked him to, you know, come with them. Not only did they take his seatbelt, but they took the guy off the attraction. I can tell you the guy's party seemed super embarrassed. Oh yeah, this happened like around 9 in the morning, so the park barely opened. I honestly don't know what this guy was going to expect. Overall, advice from a former cast member is don't try to fool us with the seatbelts. Our number one priority is safety, and you putting yourself in danger is a one-way ticket to Harbor Boulevard if you're caught. Anyway, I do have more stories about being a bad guy, but most of them are just the same issue, different day. It's basically a lot of rinse and repeat stories, but this one was for one of my easier attractions when it came to guests and their fun behavior. Now let's move on to another fun situation. This next chapter is going to surprise you, and it's something you probably not expect to happen because, you know, nobody recorded it. The Punchy Boys. So, believe it or not, 
We had an incident where we had an altercation. Not cast on guests, but guests on guests. Now, this next part is going to be a brief explanation of our operation side and what led up to this, but it's still not acceptable to hit people like a dingus. Anyway, we have four cabins at the attraction and each can fit 40 people. We have the A and B side and the C and D side, so that's roughly 80 people per side. Now, it's not going to be all at once because the cabins are not supposed to launch all at the same time for technical reasons as well as efficiency reasons. Now, the part where it gets tricky is when a cabin goes down. When a cabin goes down, we have to split one of the cabins from each of the sides. For example, let's say cabin C goes down. The cast members will now split cabin B between both the A and B and C, D side in the lines. So basically, A and D would be unaffected, but B would be taking guests from both sides in the lines. Usually an even 20 from each side, give or take. You could probably see where this is going. Sometimes newer cast members have a harder time splitting up the lines and will just send as normal, which would cause one of the sides of the lines to be moving noticeably slower than the other. Well, when this event happened, I was at the emerge position and I noticed that one of these sides was going slower and I was just wondering what the hell was going on. Well, guests were starting to get frustrated because their side was moving very slow. I guess one of the guests that was in the slow line was already frustrated by the time they got up to the flight deck and, you know, he had every right to be. Now, this is where the guy took it a little too far because apparently another guest accidentally bumped into him while waiting for the actual ride in the grouping area. He got so mad that he apparently started punching the guy and they got into a full on fist fight. Mind you, I'm still at the emerge position and then I hear on the intercom from one of my coworkers that I know we technically aren't supposed to say, or at least say it more professionally. They said, uh, so like Star Tours is closed or something? So everyone like needs to leave. Yeah, sorry, there's a guy up here punching people. I was like, what the hell is going on? I then had multiple guests running towards me that already have passed me at the merge position and they're screaming, there's a guy up there punching people. I don't want to get punched. These guests are panicking, and I'm letting them through our emergency exit door that leads to the VIP hallway. So basically, the building has been cleared out because one of my genius coworkers told everybody that there was a punching maniac on the loose. Just to add on some extra flavor of fun, my lead was not the attraction because I believe it was their lunch or something, and we don't exactly have radios to communicate with them like we do at Auto or Monorail. So the first to arrive on the scene was security, believe it or not. I also somehow managed to get bumped for a rotation because that's somehow important right now and I managed to get on the flight deck to see what the hell's going on. One of the guests is holding his face in the corner and you got the punchy guy literally swinging at security. The security guard was all saying, bro you can't be punching people, that's just not cool. And then the punching guy was like, I'm sorry I was just so mad and I didn't know what else to do. Then a manager and my lead show up and my lead tells me to get the rest of the guests out of the building because there's a small crowd watching this go down by the way. Luckily, most of the cast members were blocking so no nosy Nancy could record it and put it online. I know it would have been cool but we don't need Tomorrowland being like Toontown now, do we? I escorted the rest of the guests out and gave them all re to Space Mountain because, you know, I'm nice. <laughs> yeah, pretty wild story, huh? That would be crazy if it happened again in the same month. Oh yeah, it did actually. Literally a few weeks later, another punching incident happened for the same reason, but it wasn't as comedic as the guy who just was so mad. This other guy just punched the guest and then ran off. I didn't see this happen directly, but I just wanted to mention that it literally happened again in the same month. Basically, the moral of the story is don't go around punching people at Disneyland, you freaking smucks. I don't care how mad you are. Let's move on to another fun story, shall we? The day the power went out. I partially told this story in my big video where I talk about my time at the resort from start to finish. So this might be a little familiar to those who have already heard it, but I'll be focusing more on the guest perspective for this video. Anyway, I believe this was sometime in October of 2021, and I clocked in to find out the attraction was having some issues with the power that day, and the attraction was running on its backup generators. Obviously, we aren't supposed to run on backup generators, but our management said it was okay and we don't question our management team even when they want to do things that are against our operating guide. Well, this story begins with this family. I did not interact with this party until the very end of the story, but this is what my coworkers told me what exactly happened. So basically, this family had a child that wasn't tall enough to ride and cussed out the cast members at Greeter to the point where one of them had to drop position because of the insensitive things that they said. They ended up leaving the small child with the other half of their party that wasn't riding, 
and the other half made their way into the building and was apparently just being a real friendly group, if you get what I mean. They made their way up to the turnstiles and apparently cussed out one of the turnstile cast members and that cast member ended up dropping their position for what they said to them. All I know is that they boarded into cabin C and my lead was going to have a chat with them after they exited as he was waiting on the exit side of the attraction. Little did we know that, hey, remember how I told you the attraction was running on backup power? Yeah. The power went out when those guests were in mid-flight and they were stuck in the cabin for an hour and a half. Now, I'll get back to them in a moment because here's where I come in. I was about to bump out one of my coworkers for their break and another one of my coworkers came in to give me rotation. We were all in the first cabin or cabin A. We were all just in the cabin with the guests as we were getting ready to launch it. Well, out of nowhere, all the lights shut off and the doors to the entrance and exit shut. I thought our cabin was about to take off but I guess the power finally gave up. So myself and two other coworkers were now trapped in a cabin full of guests. Luckily, our cabin wasn't in flight so we were evacuated pretty quickly. We were only in the cabin for about 15 to 20 minutes before the power was restored to the building. Not the star speeders themselves because that requires a manual reset. So after a Q&A session with the guests that were in our cabins, we were all let out and we gave them re to another attraction and apologized for the inconvenience. Most of them didn't really have an issue. Well. If you know Star Tours at Disneyland, you know that there are four cabins. Well, Cabin D was also in the same situation and they are evacuated, just like us, about five minutes later. So that left Cabin B and C, which were both in flight. Oh yeah, remember that friendly family that was in Cabin C? Yeah, apparently they managed to rip off the door panels for emergency exit purposes, but luckily were not strong enough to open them, or not dumb enough because that's like a 25 foot drop or something. The cast member in the tower position didn't know this because we lost power to the entire attraction so we could not see anything on our camera system. They just saw a few door panels were missing when the cameras did come back on. Let's go ahead and fast forward just a little bit. Cabin C had to be evacuated manually via ladder by the fire department through our pit where the star speeders operate. Cabin B had their entrance ramps pumped down manually because there was a guest that needed a wheelchair to transfer and they were last to leave. Anyway, this family was apparently very nice and that's not actually a joke this time to the fire department and the other cast members that were assisting with the evacuation. However, they did get to have a chat with security because security was waiting for them with the lead before the whole power outage thing went down. So they had a chat with this family and apparently they were super nice to security as well. It's like being trapped in a suspended box for over an hour makes you nice or something. Well, this is where it gets, uh, fun. Because some of the other guests were terrified. And not because of the event, but because of this family. I don't know exactly what they said, but I just know that the other guests were mentally messed up from whatever this family said or did during the power outage. Also to add on, the rest of the family that was outside was screaming profanities and, uh, basically saying that we were in there torturing them and yeah it was just an overall fun time with this family. <sighs> the attraction was closed for the rest of the night as maintenance was going to be fixing it for a while but the head of security was questioning us and other guests after all this happening as they were trying to find out more about this family of the super duper nice people. That's sarcasm by the way, they were not nice people. Anyway, as she was questioning one of my coworkers. The same family came back as they forgot their backpack on the ride because, you know, of course. Like, y'all have been gone for the past two hours and you now just realized it? Well, since the dummies outed themselves, the head of security had a nice chat with them, but this time took them backstage. I can only assume that they were going to be escorted out for damaging company property, causing panic, and just being a swill party to my coworkers. So yeah, that's the power outage story. I just want to make it clear that sometimes stuff like this does happen, and I'm not saying karma will happen if you want to act like a douche canoe to cast members, but part of me is like, yeah, y'all deserve to be stuck in a box for two hours to think about why you wanted to be a dick sponge to my coworkers. Honestly, I've dealt with people like this before, but I have a bit more of a backbone than some of my other coworkers do, and I would have told them to be it the moment they started to act like the way they did. Now obviously, I had very little interaction with them, but I did have several different coworkers tell me exactly what they did and I wanted to share it here on the internet or at least with the seven of you still watching the video. <laughs> Stories from the flight deck. We are almost to the end of the video and for this part specifically, I want to talk about some of the fun interactions I had on the flight deck. Now, the flight deck is where guests wait to board and the star speeders themselves. 
pretty much that area. Obviously, I did cover some of them for my bad guy section, but these weren't really me being a bad guy, but just guess being, um, guess. This will also cover some of the nitpicky stuff that is more meant for cast members watching this, but repeat visitors might find this funny too. We'll start off with a basic question. How many is in your party, or how many? Pretty simple question, right? Well, not for everyone. Some guests would say that, oh, we're two, and then get mad that they had 14 more behind them. Or you ask that question and they just stare blankly at you like you just asked them a rocket science question. Yeah, sometimes it was a language barrier, but most understood the assignment. Big parties were the worst when it came to this. First of all, I don't know how you can travel with a party of 30 people because I get overwhelmed when it's just more than four. Secondly, you should know exactly how many are in your party before getting on the ride or what looks to be like the ride. The cast members are taking you literal when you say that you have two people in your party. They cannot read your mind and understand that you actually have someone else with you. This is just at the turnstile. You get asked this question again when you get to the cabin because the cabin cast member has to give you a row. This is when they would usually give me a blank stare and I would have to assume that they have two or three and then all of a sudden they have 29 because the rest are coming up the stairs. Like, no, stop. Also, how hard is it to stand on your own dot? They have dots on the floor for everyone to stand on, but yet some guests treat it like it's the game Twister and are like, right hand yellow. Like, stand on your own dot and wait for the doors to open, you goddamn pleb. Now, don't get me started on the glasses. The glasses are essential for this ride, and if you don't get them, well then, I hope you like Blur City with earthquakes. So many guests wouldn't grab their glasses, so you would have to get it for them. I mean, it's not a big deal, but the thing is, when it's a problem is when they would break them, or throw them, or just be a full on idiot sandwich with them. This one guy refused to wear the glasses because he didn't like the color black, even though he was wearing a black shirt. If you're wondering, yes, he was serious, and yes, he did complain that he couldn't see anything on the ride. Now, I have another story with glasses, but I'll save that for the final chapter. Idiots, I tell you. This one guy asked if the dark pit below the star speeder was a bottomless pit, and then dropped his backpack to see if he could hear it make a noise. I kid you not, he was like, oh, that wasn't a good idea now, was it? Yeah, no doy, you freaking dipstick. What'd you expect? He didn't whine at me to get his bag back, and I can tell you that we cannot go in there unless it's a rare circumstance. He ended up getting super lucky because that cabin ended up breaking down later in the day, and maintenance had to go into the pit, and they managed to grab this genius's backpack. I actually ended up giving it to him later before I clocked out, and he was all saying that all his stuff was in there, and how it was really inconvenient that he didn't have it. Hmm, maybe next time don't drop your important stuff into an area we can't grab you, dumb bimbo. Oh yeah, here's another fun one. Inside the cabin, sometimes we have seats that are, are unavailable, and have a seat cover on them to indicate that you shouldn't sit there. We would usually let them know about it before they boarded as well. Well, even if you did tell them, they would still try to sit on it, or something stupid. This one kid literally ripped it off the seat and threw it at the blast shield screen. It then slid down and went behind somewhere where I couldn't reach it. I then looked at the kid's mother and was like, Are you just gonna let your kid do that? You wanna guess her response? It's okay, he's 12. Like, excuse me, what? If I did that when I was 12, I would've been smacked next Tuesday by my mother. Well. That cabin had a small delay to flight because I had to go get a grabber to grab it from behind the screen, and you could tell the guests in that cabin were frustrated with this lady's kid. As you can tell, some of the stuff was just a daily occurrence, while others weren't really that common. I can tell you out of the three attractions I knew, Star Tours had its chaotic moments, but it was nowhere near my other two attractions, especially Autopia. Now let's move on to the final chapter of this video, and that's the exit. The Exit Tales Just to give a quick rundown, there are usually two cast members at the exit position, depending on staffing of course. One collects the glasses to take backstage to get them cleaned, and the other is just there to help guests with lost and found, or other miscellaneous things on the exit side. I can tell you, I despise being on the side of the attraction, and it's not because 90% of the time I was doing nothing, but because of some of the annoying guests that I had to deal with. The guests would always come up and say they lost their you know, insert item here, but it was just like two hours ago or something in that ballpark. I mean, I don't mind looking for it as now it's probably in our actual loss and found by then, but the ones that were tedious is when they just got off and left something, but already forgot what cabin they were in. Like, 
You left your hat, but you don't remember what color it was, nor do you remember what cabin? Cool, man. I would usually locate their item most of the time, but it was always awkward when I would come back and told them I couldn't find it, especially when it was a high value item like a phone or something. Now, the most common thing is guests would accidentally put their sunglasses or personal glasses in the glasses return bins instead of the ones from us. This one old lady came up to me one day as I'm putting the bag over my shoulder to take it backstage and she was all saying that she left her sunglasses in that bag. I kid you not, I saw sunglasses on her head and was like, uh, are those it? She immediately was like, no, these are my daughters, don't assume things, me. Like, damn lady, I was just trying to make it easier. So I had to dump out the bag and sift through the glasses pile, only for her to be like, oh yeah, these are it, took you long enough, and then she scuttled away. Like, thanks you old bench. Now, if you are curious, some people would accidentally keep the glasses, so we had to make sure they put it in the bins. But this one time I was coming back from dropping the glasses off backstage, and I see a guest hunched over one of the bins, like he was searching for something. <laughs> well, it turns out he was actually putting all the glasses into his personal bag, and I was just shocked. Like, how bold can you be, dude? I kind of just stared at him, then walked up and just looked at him. I then said, hey, you know these are all dirty, right? He then got spooked and dumped them out and ran off. Like, okay? I hope you know you can buy these online directly from the source. They are just 3D IMAX glasses and they aren't really anything special, especially the Star Tours ones. They are just the generic high-end 3D glasses. Anyway, I have one final story to finish off the video and it was at the exit. As you may or may not know, the attraction is a motion simulator and not everyone can hold down their meals when riding. So obviously, we do have to shut down a cabin to clean up the um, pukage. Well, this one lady decided to vomit out her entire hot dog meal as she left cabin B. I kid you not, it was like that scene in Team America, and there was so much vomit everywhere. It was on the ramps, it was on the floor as you exit, and it was about to be somewhere else. Yeah, this lady wasn't done puking up her insides, because once cabin A opened up, for she, for some reason, ran in there and vomited all up in that cabin. So not only are we down two cabins because some lady wanted the exit hallway to smell like mustard, but now, we also have the problem of cabin C and D need to walk past this vomit mess. Yeah, fun times on the exit side. I'm so glad I don't get sick from this kind of stuff easy because I was able to do a makeshift cleanup to let the growing crowd pass by until custodials showed up. I did feel bad for my custodial coworkers because this lady vomited up so much. This was the worst I've ever seen at my time at the resort. And yeah, I wasn't being dramatic about the uh, comparison to the Team America scene. Like, literally look up that scene, it was exactly like that. Well, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I do have a few more stories from Star Tours, but there are more on the uh, not safe for work side, and I'll probably make that the final video of this guest story saga to combine it all in one video from all my attractions. The next video will most likely be on the Monorail or Autopia. I do have way more stories from those two attractions because I worked them way more, but I'll see which one I'm feeling on doing next. Autopia probably has a bit more, so that might be the last one, unless y'all are demanding I do that one next. These videos will be coming out roughly every month to not oversaturate my channel with uh, Disney content. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. If you like this video and want to help support my channel, go check out some of my other content. I make various amounts of skits, films, and other series. I even have a series where I talk about the attractions I worked at on a surface level. Probably good to catch up on those before my next guest stories video to get somewhat familiar with the bare basics of them. Other than that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.